Awesome. It's so great to see so many people joining. Thank you so much for joining. Also, uh, if you want to introduce yourself so we know who's in the room in the chat, uh, you can put where you're from, your name, your pronouns, if you're affiliated with any organizations. Um, yeah, so feel free to do so so we can figure out all the awesome people that are on this call. Going to throw it over to Kayla, who is going to walk, give us uh, our land acknowledgement today. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging the, uh, the land from which I'm hosting uh, from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Anishinaabe and Odawa peoples, as well as the Chippewas of Nawash, unceded First Nation, and Saugeen Ojibwe First Nation. Uh, this land is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. The Saugeen and uh, Anishinaabe have been living on and near the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula long before settler colonialism. While the land we occupy is stolen, the Saugeen Ojibwe First Nation share their land with people who have come from all around the world. Treaties that are uh, supposed to govern the peaceful sharing of this land in, in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect have all been and continue to be ignored and violated. We, are, we all have a responsibility to reaffirm our commitment to these treaties as we build our movement. We also want to acknowledge that the impact of uh, the ongoing Canadian colonialism, uh, whether it is the fact that there are currently over 100 water advisories spread across Indigenous people's territories, making it harder for these communities to protect themselves against COVID-19, or the ongoing violations of sovereign territories for pipeline expansion or nuclear waste disposal, and known risks of spreading COVID uh, to First Nations communities, uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and Two-Spirit people, uh, the deaths and violence uh, uh, put upon Indigenous people that they experience at the hands of the RCMP and police, or in the disgraceful levels of poverty uh, that sees over half of all Indigenous children living in poverty. We as treaty peoples reaffirm our commitment to building a movement and a movement that seeks to end these injustices. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. I'll hand it over to Ahmed Gaid. Ahmed, you're muted. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's web webinar, Campuses That Care, a webinar brought to you by the Canadian Federation of Students and the Ontario Federation of Labour. My name is Ahmed Gayed. I am the Secretary Treasurer of the Ontario Federation of Labour, and I'll be hosting tonight's uh, organizing conversation. Um, I bring greetings to you on behalf of the Ontario Federation of Labour, uh, the 54 unions we represent, and our president, Patty Coates. Um, Perhaps I can flip it back to Jensen uh, very briefly here so you can outline for us um, the name changing and the caucus rooms uh, that we'll be heading into a little bit later in our program. Jensen? Be my absolute pleasure. Um, so we're just gonna put some stuff on the screen here to walk you through a couple housekeeping items uh, for this evening. Um, 
So to, there is closed captioning available for this meeting. Uh, so for accessibility needs and to access closed captioning, uh, you can, should see at the bottom of your screen uh, a CC button. Uh, so if you just click that and go up to the show subtitles, then you'll be able to see and access closed captioning for uh, this webinar this evening. Thank you very much, Jensen. I'll now... In there's a couple other things, sorry. I apologize, <laughs> um, go ahead. So, and as well, you can increase the, the font size for the chat and for the closed captioning also by hovering over the CC button. Uh, but instead of clicking show subtitles, which puts it at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can go down to subtitle settings and then you can change the size of the font. Uh, we're also going to be going into some breakout rooms later this evening, uh, which covers a couple great topics uh, for you folks to choose based on your interests and your needs. Uh, so the first room that we'll be having is the three rights. Uh, the second room uh, is on campus health and safety planning. The third room is for around joint health and safety committees. And the fourth room is around mental health. Uh, so later when we finish the panel and we're gonna be going into the breakout rooms, which you can choose based on your interest. Um, if you'd like to sign up for a breakout room, uh, simply click on the participants uh, at the bottom of your screen. And next to your name, uh, you should just hover over it and there will be two uh, blue buttons that come up. Uh, and one of them is rename. So you would rename yourself and you will put the number of the breakout room that you want to be assigned to. So for me, I'll be joining room number two, campus health and safety planning. So I've renamed myself and put number two at the beginning of my name. Uh, so later when we go into the breakout rooms, they'll be assigned based on uh, what number you've chosen uh, for the breakout rooms there. As well, we go, when we go into the breakout rooms, there's gonna be some opportunities to have uh, discussion. Uh, so we encourage you folks to uh, ask questions and facilitate discussion through those breakout rooms. And it's gonna be a great time. So thanks so much for, for being here this evening. Thank you very much. I will now introduce to you Janice Folk Dawson uh, to welcome you all. Janice Folk Dawson is the Executive Vice President of the Ontario Federation of Labour. Take it away, Janice. Why is it she? Uh, she seems to be muted. Hold on, let me see. Okay, she there we go. There, there we sorry, go. it wouldn't come off for me at first. So, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Ahmed. My name is Janice Folk Dawson. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I am really excited about tonight. Um, I think that one of the best. Uh, parts of my position at the Ontario Federation of Labour um, is facilitating partnerships and I'm really excited uh, to be partnering uh, with the Ontario Federation of Labour, uh, Canadian Federation of Students and CUPE Ontario University Workers Coordinating Committee tonight. Um, this is how we build the movement, um, gathering the collective intelligence uh, to develop creative, effective, viable solutions. And we need to make sure that everybody is at the table so all of the perspectives um, are being heard and that no one falls through the cracks because I think it's quite clear uh, when it comes to health and safety, falling through the cracks uh, can mean injury or death. Um, workers and students uh, united will never be defeated is clearly a chant uh, that we hear on our campuses and at actions um, that we do across the province and tonight is our opportunity uh, to actually put that chant uh, into action in health and safety. Um, I think workers need to take their rights under the Occupational Health and Safety Act uh, to gain protections uh, for students uh, because we share the same working, learning and living spaces and we can do that. Uh, so tonight we get to hear from a panel of incredible uh, folks who work on campuses. Um, and first, and then we're going to move into action rooms where we get to hear from each other. Um, during the panel, we're going to have a, a, a a series of polls to sort of uh, frame the discussion and to hear from you. And so I want to turn it over now to uh, Tiffany, um, who is the president of the uh, Durham Labor Council, who's going to be running the uh, poll question uh, segment of our uh, evening tonight. And so I just want to say to everybody, um, have fun, engage in the conversation, uh, and I really look forward uh, to the actions uh, that come out of this. So over to Tiffany. 
Thanks, Janice. And it's so good to uh, virtually see everyone. We have such a strong turnout. I am uh, Tiffany. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I've introduced myself in the chat box and I see that and I hope that many of you are introducing yourselves. Um, any organizations you work with, community groups, associations, faculties, campuses, unions, uh, and groups that you belong to or are affiliated with because this gives us a better sense of who has joined our discussion. And uh, feel free to message away in the, in the group chat. Uh, it's really good to see some familiar faces as well. So I'm just gonna kick it right off with um, the first polling question that kind of goes with what we had asked in the chat, uh, asked people to put in the chat box. So on your screen, you should see poll number one in progress. Who's with us tonight? Are you a domestic student? Are you an international student? Are you a young worker? Are you a student worker? Or are you a worker um, just in general? And so you just um, hit the little bubble next to what you are and I see the polling results coming in. And, um, oh wait, I'm not supposed to give the results yet. <laughs> I'm keeping those for later during the panel to spice it up. So we'll know, uh, we'll know during the panel what, uh, what the results are. So um, it looks like most people have answered that. So I do have one more polling question before we get over to the really um, exciting panel that we have planned for tonight. And so poll number two, where are you located? And as you can see, there's a lot of choices here to pick from. We start off with South uh, or Southwestern Ontario. Uh, which includes London, Niagara, Kitchener, Waterloo, Sarnia, Chatham, Kent, Guelph, and Windsor. And then uh, if you're from Northern Ontario, please uh, select that bubble, which includes Thunder Bay, North Bay, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and Kenora. Eastern Ontario folks, uh, your bubbles uh, can be filled in if you're Ottawa, Kingston, Belleville, Peterborough, and Cornwall. And of course, there's the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, which includes a large area, uh, including where I'm from. <laughs> uh, but there's Toronto, York, Mississauga, Markham, Brampton, Oshawa, Ajax, Milton, Vaughan, and the other surrounding areas there. Uh, and Central Ontario, fill in that bubble if you're from there. Barrie, Perry Sound, Owen Sound, uh, Orangeville, Huron and Grey Bruce, for example. And so we'll give those uh, we'll give those results a little bit later. And just uh, I think some, everyone's pretty much filled in the poll for the most part, or they're thinking about it still. So over to you, Ahmed. Thank you very much, Tiffany. And I won't uh, give any spoilers over here on those poll results. I'll leave that for you in just a moment. So in the meantime, uh, we will uh, we'll get those responses to you shortly. Uh, in the meantime, I'll introduce uh, the panelists for the night. Uh, we have a lineup of speakers that will set the stage for our discussions a little bit later uh, in our caucuses. First, we have uh, Kayla Weiler. Her pronouns are she and her, and she is the National Executive Representative for CFS Ontario. She is formerly from CFS Local 54, the Central Student Association at the University of Guelph, uh, where she was the External Affairs Commissioner. Uh, we also have uh, Ankit Tripathi. Uh, his pronouns are he and him. Uh, and he is the International Student Representative for CFS uh, National uh, from Trent Central Student Association of Trent University out in Peterborough. Uh, he is in his fourth year of Environmental Science Studies and uh, Business Administration. Uh, next, we have Kathleen Webster. Her pronouns are she and her. Uh, she is Vice Chair of the Ontario University Workers Coordinating Committee, OUWCC. Uh, as well as the Chief Steward for QP 2361 at the University of Western Ontario. She has been involved with her sector for over 15 years and considers her sector uh, home and a safe space, uh, often referring to all, all her uh, folks out there as peeps. Uh, and Kathleen has held, this, uh, has held several roles uh, over the last 15 years, but has never felt so humbled and privileged as she does now in her role as Vice Chair with uh, OUWCC. Uh, next, we have uh, Merlin Charles. Merlin specializes in holistic approaches to education and second language teaching methodology. Uh, he teaches courses uh, related to teacher education as well as French language and Francophone cultures at post-secondary institutions across the GTA. Merlin is a proud member of QP 3902, uh, uh, University of Toronto, QP 3903, uh, York University, and QP 3904, Ryerson University. Um, she has served as vice chair uh, colleges and on the Joint Health and Safety Committee. Uh, Merlin also recently uh, has been appointed as equity officer of the Ontario University Workers Coordinating Committee, OUWCC. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, James Watson. His uh, uh, pronouns are he and him, uh, and he is the former health and safety officer, uh, former vice president external and current member mobilizer at QP 3906, representing academic workers at McMaster University. 
is also the OUWCC rep for McMaster and a QP 3906 delegate at the Hamilton and District Labor Council. Um, so, uh, while uh, you've learned a little bit about our panelists tonight, uh, I would like to say that if you have any questions for our panelists, if we do have time towards the end of our program, we'll entertain some, entertain some of those questions and see if we can pose them to our panelists. Uh, all you need to do is simply privately message Chandra Lee Paul in the chat uh, that you see below in the Zoom call here. Uh, and uh, we will try and get those messages filtered uh, to, to me and then uh, we'll try and pose them to, uh, to our panelists. So uh, feel free to ask questions. Hopefully we have time to take some. Um, with that being said, I will pass it back to Tiffany uh, to give us some results from uh, our first couple of polling questions there. Uh, and to take us through another poll question. Tiffany? Awesome. So, uh, everyone can hear me, right? Okay, good. All right, so we're sharing the poll results. Uh, as we can see who's with us tonight, 86% of us are workers, 10% uh, of us are student workers, and 4% are international students. Uh, so that is what we have for those results. Um, and then for poll number two, uh, we see we have a mixture, 19% South, 8% North, 23% Eastern, 46% Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, and 4% Central Ontario. And I think I saw in the chat box that we're even uh, joined by some folks outside of Ontario, which is exciting. And then I just have a quick uh, poll number three before we get over to the panel, a uh, quick one that you'll get the results right away. Where do you work? Do you work on campus? Do you work off campus? Or do you work both? Uh, just trying to get some demographics here uh, that can kind of inform our uh, discussion. And I see people are voting pretty quickly. It's kind of funny because like it, it, uh, I can see the boxes moving around. So it looks like by and large, 59%, um, over half of you uh, work on campus, 60% now, 20% uh, off campus, and then 20% both. So that's a really interesting mixture there. Um, yep. So uh, those are the polling questions I have for now, and over to Ahmed with the panel. Thank you very much for that, Tiffany. So we've uh, learned a little bit about our panelists, so we might as well get right into it. Uh, we have a packed agenda. So uh, I'll ask this first question to all of our panelists. Um, and the question is, in what ways has a lack of public funding in post-secondary education contributed to health and safety issues on campus before and during COVID-19? And what precaution, uh, sorry, and what does precarious work on campus contribute uh, to uh, inadequate health and safety that puts the lives of on-campus workers and students at risk? So perhaps I can first go to Kayla for that question. Sure, thanks. Um, so I'm with the Canadian Federation of Students and uh, we represent uh, over uh, 350,000 students in the province of Ontario. So it's undergraduate, graduate uh, and college students as well as domestic and international. Um, and uh, uh, so students in Ontario pay on average $8,000 uh, in their tuition every year. Uh, while at the same time, international students pay three times more for the exact same education. Uh, before the pandemic, there was a tuition, or there was a 10% tuition fee reduction and freeze, uh, which recognizes that there's a high cost of education, um, but that this decision was made without any additional funding to post-secondary, but rather was paired with a $670 million cut to the OSEP program. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen tuition fees increase for international students, ranging from 10 to 15%, uh, with the highest being an increase of 37% of their tuition at the University of Guelph. Students who are paying in Ontario, or sorry, students who are studying in Ontario are also paying more but getting less. Uh, we uh, also see how the government funding has uh, cut, cuts have hurt workers on campus uh, who are expected to do more but are paid less. Tuition fees are being increased unfairly for international students, and this money is not being used to increase health and safety protections, uh, but we're actually seeing more precarious work on campus and more attempts from the administration to outsource services uh, to private for-profit companies, including food service, um, janitorial cleaning services, parking services, among many more. Finally, we're going to continue to see cutbacks to our classrooms um, and workplaces with the introduction of performance-based funding because this new funding formula from the Ontario government will continue to defund and privatize campuses and lead to more precarious jobs. 
uh, students' learning and living and working conditions uh, benef uh, benefit from having public campuses that are open to all. Um, and that public campuses uh, include full-time and well-paid unionized jobs and, and funding for health and safety protections. Um, and when it's when students and workers are working together, to build a public campus on uh, public campuses for our institutions. Uh, that's when we win and that's when we see better protections uh, written health and safety, but also uh, better protections against precarious work for students and workers on our campuses. Thank you very much for that, Kayla. Uh, perhaps I can go to Ankit after. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, hi, everyone. I just wanted to let everyone know that today um, I'm I'm speaking to you as a perspective and not so much as a representative. Uh, safety is, for administrators, expensive. In the lack of public funding, typically, safety measures, of, safety measures are the first things to go away, along with the funding for students. It's sad, but workers and health, workers' health and safety are more expendable than the salaries of top administrators. And that's the worst, uh, that's the worst of what we're seeing today. Uh, I am, from international students' perspective, um, it's already hard to find work when you come to Canada on campus or off campus, um, paying thousands upon thousands of dollars of um, money for tuition. I'm going to disclose my debt today. Um, my bank let me know how much I owe them, and it is eighty-six thousand dollars nine hundred and twenty-three as of um, this point of time. So yeah, that's that's how much we pay, and in turn, I'm struggling to pay rent. I'm excluded from several government programs, and do not have healthcare in the province. That goes to say a lot. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, our lives are compromised and there's not being done there's not enough being done to take care of us thank you very much ankit um next kathleen thank you so once again i'm uh, kathleen webster vice chair for the OUWCC. and um from my perspective so i don't believe that a covid 19 um is actually uh to blame for a lot of the issues that we're experiencing health and safety issues we're experiencing on our campuses rather that it exposed our pre-existing um issues um most of our campuses, uh, even prior to COVID-19, were operating at what we call an APA standard of unkept neglect. Uh, this was very much a direct result of the underfunding. Um, our staffing levels um, were required to uphold a higher standard of cleaning, weren't and continue to be um, inadequate. Due to the lack of funding, a significant number of institutions, as Kayla's mentioned, have contracted out their services, resulting in um, a lot of the contracted out staff's wages being a lot lower, um, and access to benefits um, is non-existent for these members, um, up into including any sick leave provisions. Um, which forces individuals into a scenario where they're, they're, they have to decide whether or not they go to work sick um, or provide for their families in order to provide for their families. Um, this, this exposes um, the university community and puts it at a higher risk of illness or, and especially in a pandemic, like I said, this highlights um, the need when you've got folks coming into the community um, sick because they've been forced into a, a decision that nobody should have to make. Um, contracting out our services contributes to less oversight from our employers, uh, as well as um, resulting in a lot more health and safety issues and concerns. This is in part due to the fact that uh, contracted out services lead to most of those employees have a lack of training. Um, we've got uh, not an adequate amount of PPE being provided. Um, not to mention when you're dealing with an outside contractor, we, uh, the institutions themselves have no control over where those employees work. So they often find themselves working in multiple locations. Again, um, exposing more and more uh, communities, potentially, 
um, to illnesses. Um, that similarly, uh, that precarity uh, on our campuses contributes much, much the same way as contracting out with individuals, often being student workers or academic workers, but also we see precarity in our food service um, workers as well as our cleaning services. And in order to make up a decent living, an individual um, in those precarious situations are often holding multiple jobs at multiple locations, uh, like I mentioned before, um, coming into different communities um, with the potential uh, spread of illness. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go to Merlin. Okay. Hi, yes. So one of the first things that always come to mind when I'm asked this question is the manner in which the government consistently underfunds the cleaning and maintenance of our campuses. Not only is the impact acutely felt by our comrades, who clean and maintain our campuses as they struggle to keep up while short-staffed. As academic contract workers, precarity has a significant impact on health and safety. We often say that our contract workers, our contract academic workers are road scholars because they are often cobbling together contracts at multiple universities in order to make ends meet. So in an environment where we're trying to lessen the spread of a virus for which we have no real treatment, that is going to be a significant issue. It will create a scenario where someone who is asymptomatic could then potentially spread the virus to another campus or campuses. Or it could be a student who, as a result of a joint program, and sometimes we see more of, more of this as um, program, um, programs are costs are cut, right? So this is, um, so also traveling to multiple campuses um, with this risk could arise. So finally, these are issues that could have been mitigated both before the pand pandemic and now through real, sustainable, adequate funding of all our campuses. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Merlin. Next, we'll go to James. James? Hi, everyone. Um, so on the lack of public funding and precarious work, I think a lot of what we're talking about um, is austerity, not only in the post-secondary sector, but across the public sector as well. Um, and that involves you know, cutting corporate taxes and taxes for the wealthy, and then passing along those spending cuts to public services, public sector workers, and to the people who rely on publicly funded services. And part of the problem is funding, but I think the other part of the problem is how modern universities are run. And that's often is for-profit public institutions um, who are interested increasingly in you know, increasing their assets through gobbling up real estate or entering financial markets. And when universities are run like corporations, uh, they have a tendency to prioritize profits over people. And that's gonna have an impact on health and safety uh, if they're trying to cut corners to maximize profits. So for example, instead of, instead of dealing with the millions of dollars of deferred uh, maintenance and hiring more staff so that people aren't working short, uh, a lot of universities will, you know, invest in a new uh, state-of-the-art business building or uh, take some real estate off campus to help their balance sheets. Uh, instead of providing people 
with meaningful, secure full-time work. Uh, they increase precarious contract work. And Merlin just said, you know, often that means taking jobs at multiple campuses, especially for, uh, for us, it's uh, sessional workers. Um, we also know that precarious workers are less likely to report health and safety concerns because they're worried about reprisals, about not having their contracts renewed if they're seen as troublemakers. Um, so reporting health and safety incidents and hazards can often go underreported. Uh, added to the physical uh, health and safety issues uh, is the relationship between precarious work and mental health outcomes, um, where precarious work leads to higher levels of anxiety, high le higher levels of stress. And I think that with COVID, uh, we shouldn't expect anything different than more austerity. It's what we've seen for the last 30 years. And uh, I think it'll be coming down the line at us. And you know, budget cuts are going to mean more and downward pressure on wages and working conditions. And we have to organize in our student clubs, in our unions, in our communities uh, to make sure the solution isn't more austerity and isn't more corporate governance because uh, both policies have failed working people and public service users across the board. Thank you very much. So thank you to our panelists for uh, taking that first question. You know, what we heard there is that there is a, a lack of funding or underfunding that's happening. Um, you know, whether you're a student or international student, uh, you know, or precarious worker uh, on campus, uh, there's a number of issues that were pre-existing. And of course, you know, the fact that we're in the middle of a global pandemic just exacerbates or makes, worsens uh, these issues. So thank you very much uh, for those uh, replies and those answers uh, to our panelists. Uh, I'm going to shoot it over uh, to Tiffany uh, for a moment to take us through a, another polling question to set up our next segment. Tiffany? Great. Yep. So you probably thought the polling was over, but it's not. Now it's actually kind of like a pop quiz format where we have a question for you. Um, and that is, it should be uh, on your screen now. Um, how many young workers are injured or killed on the job every day in Ontario on average? So um, some of you might know this answer. Some of you may just be guessing. Um, uh, the, we will reveal the results later on in the panel. And as you're um, responding here, I just want to say the panelists are doing an amazing job. I've already learned so much. Um, and thank you to everyone who is participating. I see uh, almost 50 people um, have voted so far, which is great um the so yep it looks like most people have voted now so um we'll tell you the res the answer to the poll um as well as how people thought uh the answer should go uh in a little bit but back to the panel and back to you Amin. thank you very much tiffany so um our again for if you have a question for our panelists uh, feel free to directly message that question to Chandra Lee Paul, and we will do our best to try and get to those questions towards the end of this segment, um, time dependent, of course. Um, but I will go to our panelists now. Uh, specifically, I'm going to go to uh, Kathleen and Kayla um, for our next question. Uh, in what ways are workers and students included uh, and or excluded from health and safety plans, strategies uh, on campuses? Uh, what are some of the tactics that can be used to strengthen the voices of students and workers to improve health and safety on campus for all? So perhaps we'll go first to Kathleen. Hello again. Um, so first off, um, I can think of uh, a lot of um, examples of how students are actually not included. Um, I can only think of uh, one example, and we'll talk about that in a second, about what, uh, how they are included. Um, so first off, I want to say that, uh, again, uh, prior to COVID and whatnot, um, students have not been included in any health and safety discussions, and that's for the simple fact that they have no legal rights under uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, nor do they have any uh, legal rights under the Landlord-Tenant Act, which um, I find quite disturbing um, and interesting, considering it, it means that they have um, no voice or vote when it comes to their um, learning conditions, their working conditions, and their um, living conditions. Um, 
so so that's the problem um that is how they are not included now how we um see them being included in the conversation is i feel it is up to us as workers reps who do have voice and vote um it, it's incumbent upon us to reach out to the student population to find out what those issues are and to provide them space, um, even if it's our voice that needs to do that um, during these conditions, when, and these conditions being that they currently have no legal uh, rights. Um, so uh, one of the tactics that you would use um, to do that, I feel, is uh, to form a really good, if you don't already have one on your campus, form a very good, strong campus coalition that includes both students and workers. Um, that way you're more readily able to hear what those issues are and be able to bring them forward um, and lend your, lend your voice or lend your seat um, to those students so that they have an opportunity. Um, I think that's the short term goal as far as what we're living with right now. Um, and keeping in mind that I think the long term goal is that we do continue to advocate and work for um, inclusion into uh, uh, making sure that they do have a legal right um, to participate. Thank you, Kayla. Um, great. Yeah, I, um, I agree with Kathleen and, and the fact that a great place to start is joint health and safety committees. Uh, when I was at my students union, um, I was, uh, you know, lucky that the fact that I was oftentimes invited as an observer uh, to those uh, joint meetings. Um, and uh, as by, by being an observer, I understood better of like what the role of the health and safety committee was, um, but also like what were the ways that I could play a role as a student in my union coalition to help out workers on campus. Um, and so actually when I was at my student union, um, I, a key thing that the administration used to do uh, was they would share information to the student union, um, but not to workers on campus. Um, and so that was a way to try to divide us. Um, so by uh, being on the union coalition um, with uh, different folks on, who are working on campus, we we're able to share that information and as well as like strategize as a team on uh, how we're gonna deal with uh, different issues. Uh, because you know uh, there are going to be groups who are going to try to divide students and workers because they know how powerful we can be uh, when we have a student union and we have our labor unions on campus speaking as one voice and, and, and with a united voice um, so uh, if you're off campus uh, i also recommend that you have uh, students join your labor council meetings within your city um, it's great to hear uh, information from the campus and how that affects uh, workers on campus, but also the role that we can play uh, within our communities to strengthen uh, students and workers in that coalition together. Um, and just an experience that I had is when I uh, worked uh, on campus, I worked at uh, the residence desks um, at the University of Guelph. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of issues uh, in residence, uh, which is also people's uh, living conditions as well as their working conditions. Um, there was a lot of issues with mental health and safety um, and uh, actually a lot of violence with internally within in residents and um, this is a not a shining moment for the administration uh, because they had failed workers on on the campus um, there was issues uh, where the policies and, and, and practice around dealing with violence in campus uh, and in residents actually put workers in, in harm's way uh, without the proper training um, our campus coalition, we worked together to have a comprehensive mental health survey sent out to uh, all workers on campus uh, to talk about, you know, the effects of working in, and the benefits of working in pairs, uh, the benefits of having proper training, um, and as well as a proper recording mechanism uh, so that, you know, people can rec record and report instances of uh, unsafe work, uh, but as well as uh, unsafe uh, conditions. And, um, by working as a union coalition and having the survey and the, the collected photos of unsafe conditions, uh, we were able to go uh, to committee meetings united together, literally sitting beside each other, saying with a united voice uh, that the administration had to step up and do something about this issue um, and that they needed to consult workers and students about <laughs> what needs to be done, uh, but for them to put the, put the funding into better uh, health and safety training for students and workers on campus. Um, and this is an example of how, uh, you know, when we're united, um, we can win these things for students and, and workers and, and we can come from it at different angles and whether we're calling for uh, better health and safety conditions or a free education system in the 
province. Uh, we're going to continue to work together um, because we know that we can't be defeated uh, when we are united uh, as, a, as a joint group. Uh, so those are just some of the lessons that I learned from on campus uh, by, by the working with the Union Coalition. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kayla and Kathleen. Obviously, you know, united we rise, divided we fall. So obviously making those connections between uh, the student bodies and obviously uh, people working on campus uh, are very important. Excellent examples and suggestions of how to get involved in those uh, health and safety spaces and on committees. Um, so at this point, I'm going to um, uh, go back to Tiffany uh, to uh, give us some results from that last polling question that we took. Great, Tiffany? thank you. Yeah, perfect. So um, just to jog your memory, the question was how many young workers are injured or killed on the job every day in Ontario on average? And um, if you can see the results, it looks like uh, most folks either guess between 10 to 20 or uh, between 21 to 49 or between 50 to 100. It was kind of split that way. And so the answer is actually um, every day in Ontario, an average of nearly 50 young workers under age 25 are injured or killed on the job. And this is uh, per Infrastructure Health and Safety Association website. So that's um, a lot of people look like they were kind of uh, close to that number. So it doesn't look like it's a surprise to everyone here and a very stark statistic. Um, and so that is it for my almost final polling question. There'll be one more later on in the panel. So back to you, Ahmed, and the panelists. Thank you, Tiffany. So the next question is gonna be for uh, Merlin and Ankit. Um, so what are some of the unique health and safety issues specific to international uh, on post-secondary campuses? Um, how can students on campus, uh, workers unite in creating health and safety plans and strategies to address health and safety issues and to inform campus reopening? Um, so maybe I'll go to Merlin first. Okay. Well, admittedly, I am always hesitant to address issues that international students are facing, as I can speak, um, as I can speak to this with um, experience. Uh, that being said, one thing that I can say is that it is an incredibly serious issue that international students in Ontario have zero access to public health insurance, despite the fact that these are individuals who contribute considerably to our society through the work that they do, the research that they are often performing on, on campuses, right? Uh, so I'm cognizant as someone who is domestic that I have uh, easy access to a medical system, that someone who is working in a lab beside me, contributing in the same manner that I am in our communities does not, right? So that needs to change. And I think that um, the way that we can make that change, make that change happen, uh, is by working together through campus alliances, um, of workers and students to push these issues forward, to demand the creation of health and safety plans that fully address the needs of students and workers. And as workers, we have to access, we have access to the joint health and safety committees to be able to advocate for our students. Thank you very much, Merlin. You're welcome. I'll uh, now go to Ankit. Yeah, thank you for those words, Merlin. And I echo a lot of those same things. Um, we know that knowledge is power and information is key to creating knowledge. And it seems that international students have been largely disempowered by the way of not knowing our rights when we work on campus, such as the right to refuse work. I didn't know about it for the longest time. And when I did find out, I exercised it. I, I can assure you, I used it regularly. It was great. It was great to say no, and saying no is powerful. 
training in terms of knowing your rights and knowing uh, what what you can and cannot do is usually is usually uh, administered through administration type folks. Um, it's and if not them, then it's through a virtual training in which you just get in overloaded with information, likely don't remember most of it. And then you just give your certificate to your employer saying that, yes, I can perform work and you will not be sued by me. Um, it's, it's, it's really just in the benefit of the administrators and the employers. It doesn't do anything for us. So what if, here, here's a radical proposition. What if student workers were trained about their rights through labor unions, from labor partners on campus, from OPSUs and QPs who know about these rights and can actually let us know. Um, maybe taking it another step further would be to unionize campus workers under some of these um, unions at a reduced fee and slash or um, alternative ways of uh, campus student workers to get uh, involved with these unions. Let's take it another step further. Let campus uh, organizations, students unions, in my case, the PCSA or the Trent International Students Association, being able to organize and negotiate with our administration along with the QP and the OPSU partners that we have on campus. These are great ways that we can continue building coalitions, as Kathleen said. Um, and the last thing that I think we can actually do to make sure that international students are able to come back on campuses is include students from different demographics or maybe have large-scale open meetings for campus future health and safety and for reopening with students sitting in on them and i'm not talking picking your favorite students from the student population or the existing board of governor student seats i'm talking opening it up on public post your link on the website allow students to zoom bomb your board of governors meetings i think that's the way to do it if that's not democracy then i don't know what is Thank you very much, Ankit. I uh, thank you very much to uh, to both Merlin and Ankit for those answers. Uh, I quite like that idea. Um, you know, perhaps an idea to explore a little bit more thoroughly, creating those labor partners. Perhaps there's resources there that already that exist and trainings that already ex exist that uh, international students uh, can tie into. Excellent ideas. Um, the next question, uh, you know, is for uh, James and Ankit. Um, and the question is, uh, what policy changes can institutions and or government make to in, uh, assist international students? So perhaps here I'll go to James first. Hi everyone. Okay. Um, well, admittedly, uh, I'm not an international student, uh, but as a starting point for me, uh, I think it's important to listen to international student concerns, uh, make sure there are spaces for international students and workers to take positions of leadership and work within our own organizations to meaningfully address and prioritize the concerns that come up from those members and students. Um, whether it's policy decisions from governments or university on things like visa access, access to scholarships and grants, uh, racism and discrimination on campus, the rising tuition rates, uh, difficulties immigrating permanently after graduating. Um, these are students and workers, the government and universities often treat as second class citizens. And our student unions and our labor unions, of which international students and workers are a vital part, need to make sure that the issues that I just talked about aren't treated like second class issues. Um, in terms of what universities and governments can do to assist international students, dealing with the uh, issues I just mentioned would be a great start, uh, just based on what I know from my experience working with QP 3906 and our international officer and our international committee. Um, but <laughs> universities and governments have known for decades how they can assist international students. Uh, for me, it comes back to um, austerity and corporate university governance. Uh, we need fully funded public universities with equal citizenship rights and institutional access for international students and members. 
And that's not a direction we're currently heading in. Uh, so we need to organize for alternatives and be able to disrupt the status quo if these institutions keep ignoring us. Thank you, James. Anke? Yes, thanks, James. Those were um, great words. I really appreciate your empathy for international students. Um, now, I'm not very well versed in labor policy, but my stance on this issue remains that temporary residents and international students with a study permit should 100% have access to everything as if a permanent resident could. That means give us access to OHIP. I currently don't. Um, if I were in Ottawa and I decided to go to Gatineau and I don't know, broke my leg there, I'm screwed. That's a fact. Um, let's talk about um, access to OHIP. Before we start fighting for um, free education, which would be ideal, can we at least have access to OHIP? International students can't access jobs on many campuses, including at Trent. Almost 80% of the jobs that are uh, posted are only for students that qualify for the Trent work study, uh, work study permit, which is students that are, uh, that are eligible for OHIP. That's not great. We live in the same city, we pay roughly the same rent, but you have more access to jobs than I do. Not fair. Um, any benefit of potentially uh, having campus workers and students uh, join hands and work and organize together is that student unions are registered not-for-profit and can't strike. But if we work on anything together, that means the striking capabilities of students are actually realized by virtue of working with labor unions. Just an idea. Okay, thank you very much uh, to both James and Ankit there. I'm going to uh, flip it back to um, Tiffany uh, to give us some of the results of uh, poll number five. Great, thanks. So uh, poll number five, uh, the question will be asked in a similar fashion as the last uh, one, which is kind of like a pop quiz to see where you're at. Uh, as far as this uh, question, the results will be given right away. So in any given week, how many workers in Canada miss work due to uh, mental illness? So as you can see, it's a multiple choice question. Um, do you think it's 500 workers a week, 5,000, 50,000, or 500,000? Uh, in any given week, uh, miss, miss work. So I see we have the results coming in. Um, uh, people are still putting forward their answers. And it looks like most people have answered right now. 81% of you have uh, answered. So I will reveal the answer. Well, first off, I'll say that 50,000, uh, most people uh, guessed or thought that 50,000 uh, workers in Canada miss work due to mental illness. And the answer is actually every week, at least 500,000 workers in Canada miss work due to mental illness um, and the results uh, of personal workplace and economic impacts can be devastating. By comparison, the city of London, Ontario has a population of 385,000. Uh, and this statistic came from the Center for Addiction and Mental uh, Health CAMH website. So um, thank you for taking that poll. And uh, that was our last uh, polling or pop quiz for the evening. Uh, thank you for participating in that. And back over to you, Ahmed and the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Tiffany. Just a reminder, you know, health and safety concerns, like injured workers at work, uh, every illness and injury at work is preventable. So, I mean, these are, this is like a, a, a shocking uh, stat. Uh, to, to sort of hear. Um, the next question I'm going to pose to uh, Merlin, uh, and uh, that question is, what are some of the health and safety challenges that you foresee having an effect on students and workers in the fall semester? Okay, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind with this question is mental health. The impact will be significant on both students and workers, and there will be uh, multiple layers to that. We're asking academic workers to manage their daily lives and their jobs, um, and all, uh, all from home, right? So while trying to cope with other responsibilities like childcare, um, that are now even more pressing 
as a result of COVID-19. So we're not seeing the level of support that academic, academic workers need to be successful. Um, there seems to be an assumption that we can just toss academic workers in front of a computer, um, that we expect them to provide at their own expense oftentimes, and away they go. <laughs> uh, so that has a mental health impact as we scramble to figure out what we are doing and the support we need isn't always there. Uh, we already seen the anxiety that it is causing, right? So the situation we are facing as um, campus, uh, campuses reopen will further isolate students, leaving them struggling without appropriate mental health supports. We were seeing the impact of men mental health and the lack of support um, in places like um, at UFT, uh, the University of Toronto. I know that, for example, at UFT, one QP local in a span of 18 months uh, lost four members who died from suicide. So the impacts are really there. Um, and they're now only going to grow, unfortunately. Um, further adding a layer to this issue, to this, of course, is the issue of racism. We saw that before, and we'll see it again even more on our campuses now. This pandemic has sadly only further highlighted the racism that we see in Canada, on our campuses, in our communities, and it's important that we fight, we fight back against that, and that fight needs to be relentless. Again, at this time we're living in right now, um, as we can see with all what's happening globally, now is the time to really ask ourselves the difficult and sometimes uncomfortable questions when it comes to racism, especially anti-Black racism. So we need to really, really uh, attack <laughs> this on, head on to be able to bring about real changes and to eradicate racism in, on our campuses, um, in, in all various institutions across Canada and quite frankly, the world over. Merlin, thank you very much. I agree with that sentiment 100%. Uh, and thank you for naming it. Without naming it, we cannot find a solution or fix the problem. Um, Anti-Black racism is real and it exists. And we know there's issues of anti-Indigenous racism and racism in general. So we have to name it uh, because it is real and it does exist. Uh, and we have to fight that back uh, and fight that back together. So thank you very much uh, for that sentiment and that comment. Um, I do appreciate that. Um, so we are a little pressed for time uh, right now, but uh, we do have some questions that have come up uh, from our participants tonight. And I wanna make sure that we at least have an opportunity to answer one of those questions. Uh, so I'm not going to an, uh, ask all the questions, but I will uh, bring up one question and I will go to either one or two of our panelists and uh, feel free uh, to jump forward and answer this question. Um, but this question is from Juanita, uh, and the question is, are we any further ahead in terms of our right uh, to refuse unsafe work? And have there been any attempts, uh, uh, successful attempts at that, uh, of refusals uh, to work on campus? So I'm not sure if there's any examples that do exist. So I'll go to our panelists or concede to our panelists uh, to provide those examples of uh, any do exist. So I'll open up the floor. Um, this is Kayla. Uh, I guess I can um, 
I'll quickly jump in. Uh, I think like just from my own experience, the first time I ever heard of uh, Right to Refuse on Safe Work uh, was the third year into working myself. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd started working at the age of 15 and, and hadn't actually learned about uh, what, I, you know, you, you learn about it, but you don't actually feel the, um, I feel appropriate to to enact it because especially in, as a young worker and on kit talked about this too is like uh, international students as workers like you feel like you can't claim unsafe work um, and that you'll actually just be bullied into doing a work that's unsafe um, and in a situation for myself is like cleaning behind a, a hot stove while a pot of soup was cooking like that's definitely something that is unsafe um, and I think like a part of also on campus is the fact that even though work even though students are not necessarily working on campus uh, there's still a lot of unsafe conditions and uh, there must be a way for people to know uh, how to report unsafe working conditions but also feel comfortable that they're not going to be uh, penalized either by uh, being demoted or other changes to their work um, simply because they've reported unsafe work. Thank you very much for that, Kayla. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other panelists that wish to speak. Um, feel free to speak now or forever hold your feet. Okay. So perhaps that's a good segue for us to head over to our uh, discussion or our organizing caucuses. Of course, you would have made your selections. Uh, and I'll ask Jensen to jump on and uh, uh, walk us through that process one more time um, uh, in just a moment. Uh, but before we head over to those caucuses, and I send it over to Jensen, uh, since we won't be coming back in a much larger group tonight, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for joining us tonight on behalf of the Ontario Federation of Labour, on behalf of uh, our president, Patty Coates, who by the way is joining us here tonight, on behalf of uh, uh, Janice Folk Dawson, our friends at the CFS, uh, and obviously everyone here, and especially with the volunteers that are helping us tonight, that we have some uh, from uh, the CLC and other organizations. Just wanna say thank you very much for joining us on behalf of everyone, and thank you to all those volunteers helping us uh, in the background. Um, you know, we, uh, we put this uh, weather, uh, webinar together so that, uh, you know, we can come together and have this or, uh, organizing conversation together. Um, and uh, that's about, uh, about um, that is what is about to happen uh, in just a few moments. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hearing what comes out of these caucuses uh, and what comes out of these discussions. Take it away, Jensen. Thank you. Awesome, so let's wait till Minnie puts the slides up there. Uh, so as we're gonna go into the breakout rooms right now, if you folks haven't already done so, uh, to sign yourself up for the breakout room, there is gonna be four. Uh, so the first one, room one, is the three rights. Uh, the second one, room two, is campus health and safety planning. Uh, room three is on joint health and safety committees. Room four is on mental health. Uh, so to assign yourself to a breakout room, which we're gonna go into shortly, uh, if you hover over and click on the participants button, you will see your name. And if you haven't already done so, uh, you can um, find two blue buttons when you hover over your name. And if you click more and go under rename, uh, you should be able to rename yourself and put whatever number uh, that you would like to put uh, in front of your name to go into a breakout room. Uh, so for me, I'm gonna be going to room two, campus health and safety planning. Uh, and so I've renamed myself and just put the number two in front of my name there. Uh, so Maneem is going to assign us all to our breakout rooms shortly, uh, but there's a couple questions that we encourage you folks to ask as well as your own to help stimulate conversation to bring us closer towards some action items. So some of those questions that you can ask to stimulate uh, conversation is, uh, what would a safe campus look like for you? And what would make you feel safe coming back to work? Who is not part of the conversation that should be included? Who are our allies that we can call upon on campuses, in our communities, or in governments to help push for the voices of students and workers to be included in campus reopening health and safety plans? How will students and workers' mental health be influenced by online learning and working? And what are some supports we can offer? And what are some actions we can take? Uh, so we're hoping that hearing from the discussion and uh, the great panelists that we've had this evening to be able to take that conversation, go a little bit further and come up with some actionable items of how students and workers can work together to strive for strong health and safety measures with regards to campus reopening, but even beyond that to transform the health and safety nature of campuses uh, in Ontario.
So in just a moment, I guess everyone will be transported into their room. Just to note, uh, Maneev here for uh, just serving as tech. If you haven't picked a breakout room, I'm totally gonna randomize it and throw you into one because all the discussions are really sound and good, all right? And I'm just saying you're missing out, but I'm gonna throw you into a room if you're not already assigned, okay? Thank you. Okay, we still got some stragglers. I'm gonna throw you into a room. You have Nicole who chose room number two? Yeah, I thought I'd put her in there. Yeah, yeah, she's in there now. Um, okay. And then you have, oh, Kim is the captioner. Okay, got it. I think everyone's in. Perfect. Oh, Kim, you don't have to do captioning anymore. I'm going to sure. stop recording. Kim is muted. <laughs> she says thanks. Thank you, honestly. I don't, I don't think I have the skill.